So I'd been digging into Genesis 21, 33, the story of Abraham, where he, for the first time, used the name of God, everlasting God. And that had captivated me. I thought, why did he use, why did he coin, come up with, use a new name that had never been used to call on God? Elohim didn't satisfy him. Yahweh wasn't the right word or name. They all have meanings. El Shaddai just didn't do it. Adonai wasn't, wasn't right. He, I need a new name. And he said, you're, you're Olam. You're Olam El, everlasting God. And it doesn't just mean that God is eternal. It means that he's the God outside of time who lives in eternity, the timeless realm. One lexicon says it means the most distant times both ways, past and present and future. But, but that really, even that definition doesn't, violates the concept of Olam because anytime you use the word time to define it, you just, you just violated it, the concept of Olam. You can't use the word time, even distant time. He's the God of eternity that, out, that is outside of time, that sees yesterday, today, and forever all at once. Isaiah 46.10 says he declares the end from the beginning. God is the only person that doesn't start at the beginning. He starts at the end. He sees the end, and he declares the end from the beginning and then he backs up and begins to unfold the process so because he declares the end from the beginning he never he's never trying to figure out anything he never finally gets around to anything he never finally decides anything he's always moving toward what he's already seen so before the fall ever took place, he had prepared the cross, the lamb. Isn't that awesome? He's never, he's never trying to f figure out how can I outsmart the devil. He's already outsmarted the devil before the devil's made his move. Yeah. So, you know, Abraham had gone through this 25-year period of waiting for Isaac and the promise of giving, giving him a son and through that son a nation being formed and he'd had his ups and downs he had even though he was a man of great faith that didn't waver that was at the end he did waver in the beginning he wavered so much that he and Sarah both laughed at God on one occasion when God said you're gonna have a son still I mean Abraham said I'm 99 She's 90. This ain't going to happen. And, and Sarah had, not only were they past the age of childbearing, she had been barren all along. So it wasn't just old age, it was just her, her body was not even able to reproduce, ever. And they had wavered, and they wavered so much that they finally connived and Ishmael came along. He entered into a relationship with his maid. Twice in his weakness and fear, he told the king, because he was afraid maybe the king would want to take Sarah. Uh, Sarah was certainly in her younger years, very beautiful, scriptures say, and he said, if they, they may want you as their, one of their wives, so let's just tell them you're my sister so they won't kill me to get you. That's covenant breaking as far as I'm concerned. It's certainly lying. But God, but, but, but Abraham is not known and spoken of by God as the covenant breaker or the liar or the unfaithful one or the waverer. Because God, even when he calls us, he, when he called Abraham, and he can look ahead and say, mm, he's going to mess up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've already seen the end. 
and I know that I can clean all that up and I can transform this man and I can put what I need in him. And when all said and done, he won't be the covenant breaker. He'll be the covenant keeper. And he won't be the liar. He'll be my friend. And he won't be the wavering man that has to connive with his wife's maid. He'll be the strong, he'll be the father of faith. And Abraham was saying, you know, the God who's outside of time that can cleanse my past, get me to the future he saw for me. Even in spite of my failures, he can navigate me through all that. How did you do that? And he, he calls on the God who can heal the past, deal with the present, and guarantees the future. And the Lord said to me, if you're going to take out the giants, one of the gloves you're going to have to wear is a faith that I'm bigger than your failures. And then when I called this nation to be the greatest stronghold beachhead on the planet for the gospel. Don't miss that, please. The strongest, greatest base beachhead for the gospel of Jesus Christ on planet earth. When I called this nation to be that, I knew, I knew she would fail. I knew there would be broken covenants with the native people. I knew the slavery issue would come. I knew 60 million babies would be aborted. But I know that my blood can cleanse from all of that. And I looked ahead and I saw I can get this done through this nation. And I tell people, my faith is not in America's goodness. And when people dec decry our past and say, God can't, I say, my faith, uh, no. My faith is that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin and unrighteousness, all of it. But in the early 2017, I had, uh, you know, I, I would often go to the, to the verse and, and, read Genesis 21, 33, and it happened in Beersheba, a place called Beersheba. It means the well of covenant. And I probably read it hundreds of times. Just think about it, meditate on it. But the Lord said, I want you to go to Beersheba again. And I started to open my Bible. And he said, no, I don't want you to go to Beersheba in the Bible. I want you to go to Beersheba. I want you to go to that well, to that place. I have an impartation for you there. It's time to get the gloves. At a new level. It's not that I didn't already understand Ol Olam, everlasting God and covenant, but he said, I want you to go to that place where Genesis 21, 33 took place and get the gloves. And I did. There's just a lot of packed. You can buy the little book, Giants Will Fall. Read about the demonic encounter I had in the Istanbul airport when the enemy tried to insert himself into that process. But that's not my point for tonight. My point is that while I was there, Chuck said, I want to go with you. And we'll, we'll go together. And you go to Beersheba and get your gloves. And when you come back to Jerusalem, we'll do a couple, few, some services together. So on the way back from, from my trip to Beersheba, he called me. And he does what he does frequently. He gave me a phrase that he said God had spoken to him for me. He said, I don't know what it means, but it's for you. And God will tell you what it means, and you're supposed to speak on it tonight. <laughs> and I tell people, and they laugh like that, when I, sometimes I say, it's probably at least 50 times in my life when this man has looked at me and given me either one word or a phrase and said, I don't know what that means, but you're supposed to speak on it. He's done that to me 10 minutes before I get up to speak. And sometimes I just think, you know, these prophets can be annoying. <laughs> and I frequently have looked at him and said, what do you mean you don't know what it means? You're the prophet. What's it mean? <laughs> well, I don't know. God didn't tell me. He didn't tell you. But I've learned to listen, and I've also learned why God does that. 
Because if he rattles off a one line, you know, this is what it means, that's all I get. But if I press into that word and start meditating and praying in the spirit and listening, it just sort of, a lot of times it opens up a realm of revelation. So I learned to do that. I've received on the 50 state tour hour, hour long messages in five minutes that I've never preached before because he looked at me and said, I'm hearing this word. <laughs> 